Okay, we should be live. Let's double and triple check that everything looks set up right. It looks like we are set up correctly. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Let me make this a little bit better. There we go. Okay, cool beans. Always these last minute adjustments. I don't know why OBS doesn't have a, a, a zoom feature. Make things, make things a lot easier. I could just get in closer. But yes, hello, hello, hello. We'll get started right at the top of the hour. Uh, as always, I start five minutes early or so, just so I can check on the stream, make sure it's uh, actually streaming. And uh, yeah, say hi. Say how it's going. <laughs> uh, see how it's going? Say how it's going? Words are a human construct. We can construct them differently. Um, okay, and then let me get into the live stream myself. And do, do, do. Looks like it's working. Okay, cool. I can hear myself. Perfect. Hello, hello, hello. And now I can see that I have uh, one watching. Perfect. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I love these streams. It's it's definitely just like um, just like um, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, school, where everyone joins in, like the uh, the virtual sessions, where everyone joins in right at the um, last second, right? So let me see. What am I trying to pull up here? Oh, or do I? Oh, but yeah. So this will be an interesting one. Um, Island Biogeography is one of my favorites, and I'm uh, hoping I didn't over overdo it a little bit. So I'm really hoping. Um, there's like an old adage where if you're developing a presentation, it's a slide per minute. So if you have a 30 minute presentation, plan to have 30 slides. Um, but I do a very different way of doing presentations. And uh, hey there, uh, I'm doing good, doing good. I'm ready for this to start. And uh, how are you doing? Like we got about two and a half, three minutes before we get right into it. Oh, this is a fun one too. I've been meaning to do this Island Biogeography one for a long time. I want to add this to uh, its own course pretty badly because um, island biogeography is often taught just purely underneath an ecological lens, but there's there's so much more to it. I mean, it's really freaking cool. So like, I'm happy to make this presentation and kind of formalize uh, what I've been wanting to make for probably over a year now, honestly. Crazy how backlogged things have been. We're just waiting for the hour mark to start. So we got about one minute left. I'm going to pour myself a little bit more tea. This black tea blend with um, um, allspice cloves. It has, so it keeps me going. Okay, and so yeah, I'm just waiting down for the uh, clock to strike 2 p.m. Uh, we're working on adjusting some timings and a few other things for these streams. So, yeah, a warning. Um, we might update things by a little. We'll get started. Start the recording. Then do a little snap, snap for editing later.
Welcome to the Learn Adventurously webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about island biogeography, uh, which we can think of as sort of uh, isolation by uh, diversification through natural isolation. So what this presentation will do is going to cover the basic theory of island biogeography. We're going to discuss some of these processes behind the patterns that we see um, on islands. And I have three open access case studies at the end. Open access means that you can download them without any paywalls. You can read them. Um, which will demonstrate how we can study uh, island biogeography. So first, I think we need to really get some definitions down on what is an island. And we're going to define an island as any self-contained geographic area which isolates taxa over generations. So you may be asking, well, why are we defining this? We know what an island is. And that's because, yes, we can study islands as these marine islands, the island that you think of, but islands can actually be a variety of different uh, geographic areas. This can include lakes, caves, uh, seamounts, forest habitat, if they've been fragmented heavily. Um, so, so really, when we're talking about island theory, an island is just, again, any self-contained geographic area which isolates taxa over generations. That's how I define an island. That's how I think of it in my head. Um, but, um, of course, we will talk about other islands uh, but we'll largely focus on marine islands since that is what the majority of the theory is based around. And with that, let's just get into the theory. We're going to start with just this classic island theory. This is going to largely focus on species richness, uh, and this is a very uh, core ecological concept. So island species richness is primarily determined by two factors, island area and island distance to mainland. So again, island species richness is just how many species there are. And uh, just for reference, all of this material will be put up as a recap on the website, and there are handouts that will accompany that recap uh, that break down these concepts and make them a little bit more digestible. Uh, so stay tuned for those. If you've RSVP'd, you'll get an email. But let's look at island area. And this is very, very basic theory, and it's just as island area increases, richness increases. Okay, we could see that very clearly here. Uh, the larger island has more species of birds than the smaller island. This is what the theory will predict. And then when we're talking about distance, as distance from the mainland increases, richness decreases. Okay, and we are going to talk about why this occurs just coming up. But as we can see from this figure, the island that is closer to this mainland, the mainland being this area down here, um, has more species than an equivalent sized island that is farther away. Okay, um, so when we're talking about island theory, you will often see this figure here. Um, and I know it's a little bit confusing and a little bit hard to read if you're just now getting into it. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down with examples. And what we're really going to focus on are these two fundamental forces that are dispersal and extinction. And we're going to use that to relate back to that area and distance from mainland components of the theory. So for right now, just ignore, just uh, blot out from your memory that this graph even exists. We're going to ignore it for just a second and just talk about dispersal of organisms. When we're talking about island theory, we are primarily assuming, we are, we are assuming that most of the migration is from the mainland to the island. Um, it's never perfectly unidirectional. Of course, a species that can get to the mainland uh, or it can get to an island, has a chance of getting back to the mainland. But just know that we are often thinking about it in terms of mainland to island. And that is uh, due partially to extinction, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, of course, though, we can also talk about dispersal between the islands. That is a very common component of island theory. Uh, and it's really just looking at how do these organisms move between islands. Um, in the discussion about dispersal, uh, in, in island biogeography, there's often two-sided models. We have long-range dispersals, and we have the stepping stone model. These are very often used in the literature, and they are 
quite simple to break down. A long range dispersal is exactly what it sounds like. It is a uh, long range dispersal from an island, uh, for, excuse me, from the mainland to the island. Uh, this is a trait that is often found with animals that can move these far distances and not have to tread through water. Okay, in this example here, we have some type of gull bird, some type of uh, seabird, and it has much easier time traveling from the mainland to the island than say a jaguar which would have to swim or raft across right so this is a good time to mention that anything with island biogeography it is dependent on the organism and we'll see this later on with the with the uh, case studies but another way so how could an organism such as the jaguar get from the mainland at point a to the island at point b well there could be a stepping stone model. And in this case, uh, it is assumed that the jaguar would have gotten to island B by essentially stepping from island to island to island until it ultimately led to uh, it existing on island B. So if we did see some type of pattern where there were jaguars on um, point A and then, um, and then ones on point B, um, we would assume it was a stepping stone model in this case because long-range dispersal would be extraordinarily difficult for a jaguar. Uh, of course, for the bird, it could have been either of them because the birds fly around, right? They are not as affected by stepping stone or long-range dispersal. They can kind of be uh, either or. But ultimately, this concept is really related to isolation, right? Um, in this case, the long-range dispersal ones where it is farther away from the island, you have less migration and a higher extinction rate. Why is that? Well, less migration is because it's farther away, right? It's more isolated. It's harder for organisms to get to this island. Um, but we also have higher extinction rates, which we'll cover in just a second. Um, and really, you got to think about it like this. If an organism goes extinct on island B, it is much, much, much harder for a species to recolonize that island because it's more isolated. Um, often in these island mainland dynamics, species are being replenished on the island from the mainland. So that's where we're assuming that species are dispersing from mainland to island, right? Um, and then in systems that are not as isolated, we expect more migration and we expect less extinction, okay? So in general, isolation leads to extinction. That is a uh, core principle of the basic theory. And just to take a brief aside to show that uh, this exists not just in islands, um, here is a mountain island, right? So imagine that there is some species of montane salamander, and they can only exist in a particular habitable zone, right? Above this zone, it's too cold, and below the zone, it's too hot. So this is where they exist. Um, if there are salamanders on multiple peaks, and this habitable zone doesn't have any way for the salamanders to connect to one another, right? Like this salamander, if it goes down too low, it can't survive. So it has no way of getting over to this other mountain. These are very isolated populations. But say that habitable zone was much wider, say it did include the ground below, the salamanders then could uh, travel between the, sal uh, between the mountains over uh, many generations. So this is an area that is less isolated. They are more interconnected. Extinction rates are going to decline um, according to theory. So this was largely focusing on isolation, distance from shore. Let's revisit this area component. So area, as you'll remember, is the other component of island biogeography. We talked about isolation as distance from the mainland or how connected it is to other islands. Area is talking about the physical square area of the island itself. And in general, smaller islands have higher rates of extinction. So again, smaller islands, higher rates of extinctions, larger islands, lower rates of extinction. And why is that? Well, smaller islands tend to have smaller populations of organisms. So they're much more likely to go extinct because there's just fewer of them. They also tend to have less genetic diversity and less habitat heterogeneity. So they have less genetic diversity, probably because the populations are smaller. They're a little bit bored, this whole thing. I can't believe the internet goes down right when I got into it. I mean, literally the worst time. Wow. Oh, 
Hello, we are back. I'm going to look at the webinar replay. Okay, so it looks like most everything. We're only down for a minute. Sorry about this. Um, I'm looking through the webinar recap. I'm really not sure what happened. Okay, we were talking about the habitable zone, and then that's when it cut out. Okay, sorry, a huge apologies. Um, I'm not sure what happened with my internet there for a second. So what we're going to do is we're going to go backwards. Um, and I am going to assume that we covered the habitable zone. Um, so what we'll do is there will be a recap. We'll make sure it's all stitched together so it looks better. I'm recording on my end, so uh, there's going to be no delay. But yeah. Okay, cool. So let's hop back into area. Apologies. Uh, if, if anything didn't make sense, we'll leave it for questions at the end. But let's get right into it. So now let's talk about area. And an area inside of island biogeography is that other component, right? We talked about isolation. But with area specifically, it's a little bit easier to understand. So in general, smaller islands have higher rates of extinction. And thus, uh, vice versa, larger islands have lower rates of extinction, right? So why is this the case? Well, a lot of different reasons. Uh, smaller islands tend to have smaller populations, whether that's just because the island can only support so many uh, individuals. Uh, this leads to less genetic diversity and less. Uh, there's also less habitat heterogeneity on the islands. Um, you could think of this as uh, there's less genetic diversity because the populations are smaller, uh, therefore they're a little bit more inbred, right? Um, and also there's less habitat heterogeneity because on smaller islands, um, think about it like this, you can only fit so many habitats onto a single piece of land mass, right? So smaller islands have less habitats for species to exist in, and they also have higher effects of drift. This is more uh, a factor of the being small populations. Drift meaning that uh, random genetic uh, drift, that random chance that can affect species. So if you have smaller populations, higher drift, higher rates of extinction. And this is when we go back into this classical island theory, because now we have all of the necessary tools to understand this figure. So what we have on these green lines is the rate or probability of extinction, okay? And remember what we just covered. Smaller islands have a higher rate of extinction. So on this y-axis is the rate of extinction. The small island at all levels of species richness has a higher rate of extinction. This blue lines, these blue lines are the probability of colonization. We'll define this as dispersal, right? Um, they say colonization because we are typically referring to mainland to island, right? So that would be a colonizing event. Um, as we can see, the islands that are farther from the mainland they have a lower probability of colonization because on the y-axis is that probability. So ones that are closer to the mainland have a much, much higher probability of colonization. But what are we really supposed to take away from this graph? Well, the biggest thing, if we really dive in, look at this a little bit closer, um, what we're supposed to be looking at are these points where they intersect. These are equilibria. Okay, so what we assume is that if our species richness increases, say we're on a small island, right, and uh, we are rather close to the mainland for whatever reason, right? So as species richness increases with these small islands, they are going to tend to move towards equilibria, right? On a small island, we have a higher rate of extinction, so as more and more species become extinct, they are going to move uh, down in terms of species richness. Because more extinct species means less species to influence the number of species, right? Um, and then, of course, if there are uh, very few species, then the rate of extinction is a little bit lower because there are fewer species, so they will move upwards. And then you just uh, coordinate it with the closeness to the mainland, the far the distance away from the mainland, um, in order to find this equilibria point. 
So uh, as a reminder, this figure is for small islands and large islands. This is a uh, binary categorical variable. Um, so this would uh, be a little bit different for every single study system, but they are moving towards some level of equilibria. And I know this is a figure and I know this is a really confusing graph to look at. So this is how I visualize it, right? So think of the equilibria here, right? We have at this point, this is the lowest species richness on A, because it is a small island far away from the mainland. If we look at the species richness of B and C, they are roughly equivalent. Uh, we don't have an exact scale on this x-axis, but we see that um, the large island that is far away from the mainland, according to theory, is going to have only slightly higher species richness compared to a small island that is close to the mainland, as with B here. And then, you know, the, the cream of the crop is an island like D that is a large island that is close to the mainland. Um, so again, we're moving towards equilibria points. Just because an island uh, has more species than expected, um, they may be influenced by other features. But this is the theory. This is the core theory of island biogeography. And this is often where the theory ends. This is often where we stop talking about island biogeography. But I don't think that's right. Because this is ecological. This is core ecological theory. But what happens when we start incorporating more evolutionary thinking into island theory? Which, of course, this is so intrinsic to island theory. The best examples we have, um, we're going to talk about speciation, which is a core evolutionary principle, which was also a core component of underlying island theory, right? Um, if we look at the Galapagos, of course, we had Darwin's finches, right? In this case, in an evolutionary perspective of island theory, we would have some organism that was already on the island. Um, they flew over from Ecuador, right? And then now they're on the island. Over time, they diversified and went to different islands, okay? So now there's these meta populations, these, these populations on each of the islands. And over time, they will diversify and speciate according to the conditions on those islands islands right in the classic example of darwin's finches it was an adaptive radiation due to different diets right large hard seeds on drier islands needed a thicker bill in order to break them open versus um easier to crunch seeds don't need that thick bill right so this is a classic component of island biogeography it's thinking about speciation but this model is looking at how they uh, speciate between different islands. There's also speciation that can occur on a single island. And I'm so happy that animation worked because I wasn't sure if it would. Um, but this is another classic example. Say you have some anole species that washed up on a desert island, uh, on a deserted island, uh, via a coconut. This is the island raft theory of, uh, of island biogeography. Well, what happens is that anoles now goes all over the island. And what it finds is a bunch of different micro habitats. In this case, these anoles, some of them are going to be around the rocks more. Some of them are going to be in the shrubs more. Some of them are going to be high up in the trees. Some are going to be on the ground. And over time, these, they uh, form these intimate relationships with those micro habitats. And then they will diversify and speciate. So speciation can occur between islands, but also within a single island. And something we'll actually discuss further on is that in this scenario here with these anoles, you might actually be able to consider little parts of microhabitat as their own islands. But there is another facet of evolution that we really need to talk about, and that is extinction. And I'm going to introduce this concept in terms of survivor bias. So if you are a uh, biogeography nerd like myself, you've probably heard of island gigantism before. And island gigantism is a very, uh, fairly straightforward concept to understand. You have some populations of, in this case, lizards, in this case, uh, monitor lizards, on the mainland. They find their way over to an island by some... Uh, method, and then they grow larger. They become 
giants, right? And the, the reason why is they'll say that there's a lack of predators or there is an abundance of resources. There's, um, as with ecology, it all depends. There's many different ways an organism is theoretically able to become a giant. But recent research has actually shown that this may not be a factor. And in fact, in the two uh, landmark examples of island gigantism, uh, Komodo dragons and Galapagos tortoises, they're finding that this is probably not a thing. Because what happened was, if you go back millions of years, there are fossil records of Komodo dragons on the mainland that were giant, or at least the ancestors of Komodo dragons, right? So what happened? Because we don't see those on Australia. We don't see these uh, Komodo dragon-sized organisms on Australia, right? Well, what happened was those large ones on the mainland went extinct. And I apologize for the colors jumping around here, um, but they went extinct. Okay, so they migrated over to the island. They were already giant when they got to the island, and then just the mainland ones went extinct. And so now we have this apparent pattern where it looks like they were small on the mainland and then they were giant on the islands. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for why they would go extinct in some of the more critical examples. It was uh, hunting, right? It was, it was over harvesting um, from humans. It might have been climate change. Uh, so there, there's lots of different reasons why. But if we're not thinking about extinction in our island biogeography uh, results, we can really easily make some really bad claims, right? Um, and just for note, like I said, this is also the Galapagos tortoises. They're finding that, well, yeah, there just were giant tortoises on the mainland, and then they were just uh, extinct. Uh, so with island gigantism specifically, um, there is conflicting evidence, and the best examples for island gigantism are uh, hit or miss at best. And it's because we have a survivor bias, right? We have uh, extinctions that occurred that we did not account for. But also think about that in terms of the dispersal, okay? Say we're trying to figure out if there's long-term dispersal or stepping stone model for the jaguars to get from A to B. Well, in this case, we'd assume stepping stone, right? Because we can see that there's jaguars on every single island, so it's a stepping stone model. But what happens if a few of those jaguars go extinct? What happens if two of the three islands, those jaguars go out because they're small islands, right? They have uh, high effects of genetic drift, and so the probability of extinction has increased. Well, now we have this pattern, which might make us conclude that it's long dispersal, right? We don't know that these jaguars were on these islands, so we just see them going from A to B, and some methodologies may not account for this extinction. So be very, very careful whenever you're studying island biogeography or making claims based on the current day distribution of organisms. So at this point of the presentation, I'm going to go into three case studies that I hope showcase how we can study island biogeography. And the first is a very uh, straightforward example. Again, these are open access on the recap page. Um, and after this presentation, it'll be all in the description. You can find these studies. You can read them yourself. I really encourage you to actually read them. Because the first one that we're looking at is the comparative biogeography of volant and non-volant mammals in a temperate island archipelago. Uh, so volant just means flying. So in reality, what we're doing is we're comparing bats to other species of mammals and how their biogeography, uh, how island biogeography actually affects them, right? So this is up in uh, Lake Superior. These are the Apostle Islands. Um, and as you can see, it is a large archipelago. There's many, many, many islands. And they have been able to detect bats through acoustic surveys, but also uh, species like black bears, um, like the like many rodents. And then uh, there was a marten that was on the mainland, um, but they also got deer. They, they got a whole bunch of different species. Um, so what did they find? Well, they found that for volant mammals, so the bats, island size and isolation were not associated with any metrics of diversity. That's a little bit surprising. We just said island biogeography is a thing, and now we're saying it's not a thing. Well, that's because these bats can fly. These islands are so close to one another that 
it doesn't really hinder the bats on how far away the islands are in this specific ecosystem. Um, and they also, it's thought that they have ample foraging opportunities on islands. Um, this goes back into some critical theory stating that if the bats just did not have enough energy to transfer from mainland to islands and all over the place, uh, that they would be, uh, well, uh, limited in terms of where they could go. So the author stated that there's probably just enough foraging opportunities that they can have the energy to migrate around to different islands. But for non-volant mammals, so your standard mammal, uh, island size was positively associated with species richness and diversity, which is that core principle of island biogeography. But this is where it got a little interesting. They found that isolation was not significant for small mammals, but it is significant for larger mammals. And their reasoning, this was actually not intuitive at first, because you'd assume that these larger mammals are more able to swim between islands. That's what's happening with these uh, bear and with the uh, deer that they were uh, referencing in the study. But these islands are really connected. There's lots of people on boats that travel between the islands. And it is thought that this is an anthropogenic effect. This is an effect of humans because these small mammals are very easy to hitchhike, right? If you're taking a canoe out and you're going out to the different lakes, it's very easy for a small rodent to hide in a bag. Uh, and it is much, much harder for a black bear to, to hide in your bag. So this is a good time to mention that humans do affect our current understanding of island biogeography. Uh, so just keep that in mind. But it is also showing how different traits affect the influences of biogeography, right? We talked about how flying bats are less influenced by isolation and island size, but the non-flying mammals are influenced in a different way, and even the size of the mammals are influenced differently. So this is a really good study to just get your classic island biogeography um, that we would study, you know, marine islands. And now I want to take you to our second case study because I thought it was such a cool idea for how the concept of an island can be defined. What this study did was the theory of island biogeography applies to ectomycorrhizal fungi in subalpine tree islands at a fine scale. So, you know, jargon titles, uh, we always need to do those. But essentially, they are looking at the mycorrhizal networks of trees. These are fungi that have these uh, symbiotic relationships with the roots of uh, trees. And what they're doing is they're actually defining each of those trees as an island. So think about that. They're an individual tree as an island. And that's kind of weird, right? So how does that work? Well... What they did is they defined the mainland as a forest. The forest, as we could see here on the left, is the mainland because it's a dense network of trees. Effectively, these trees are all connected to one another via those root systems. But there are many trees that are not directly part of the forest. Think of this as just a tree in the middle of the field, right? Um, these effectively act as islands. They can assume that there is little to no connection of these roots, of these mycorrhizal networks between trees. And they were also able to determine the area of the islands by literally taking the area of the trees, and they used a, a cone area to actually approximate it. So this was a great study because they actually found that the richness always increased with island size and island age. They also found that richness decreases with distance from the forest edge, which again is the mainland. So they found that richness decreases on islands farther away from the mainland. So island biogeography even applies at small spatial scales, less than a kilometer, and with trees as islands. Um, so we're not relegated to just birds flying between islands or, uh, you know, no lizards washing up in the Caribbean. We actually can study island biogeography just with trees in a field, essentially, right? And this is such an awesome, awesome way of looking at biogeography. And up until now, we've really looked at just richness, right? We've really just looked at how many species there were or how many operational taxonomic units in the case of this study. 
if I remember correctly. Um, but let's hop into case study three, which is island biogeography theory explains the genetic diversity of the rock ptarmigan populations. So again, we can consider mountains as islands, right? If they are unable to be connected, they can be islands. And it should be noted, in here, they considered the largest continuous mountain range as the mainland. So there's a large mountain range here uh, that is the mainland. And the ptarmigans can fly, but they prefer to not cross unsuitable habitat. Okay, so they don't want to fly over habitat matrices that aren't suitable for them. So in essence, it is a uh, geographic barrier to them. So they are these uh, mountaintops are more isolated from one another. And they studied this uh, via their genetics. They actually collected eDNA, uh, feathers and fecal pellets from different uh, peaks, different islands, different mainland points, um, and also uh, feathers from shot birds. Um, so uh, essentially they were, if they didn't include the shot birds, right? It could be a study that's done 100% with environmental DNA, just going out, collecting feathers on different peaks and uh, determining their genetics. So what did they find? As island area increases, expected heterozygosity increases. Uh, heterozygosity is a metric of genetic diversity. Higher numbers mean more diverse, right? So they found that as the larger the islands, the more genetic diversity there was. And as distance from the mainland increases, that genetic diversity decreases and the inbreeding increases, right? So what we're finding is that even on these mountains, we are having core biogeographic principles of island theory uh, still developing, and they were using genetic techniques to look through this. Um, so you don't just have to look at how many species are on the island. You can look at it within a single species and how islands are actually affecting their genetic diversity. So these three case studies, um, I will be including links to them. Um, I wasn't able to put them in the description before this, before this stream. Um, and that is everything I had to cover island biogeography. I know it's a dense lecture. Um, our next webinar, we've been doing these weekly. I'm going to have to delay next week. We're not doing anything next week. Um, I just need to catch up on a few things because we're actually starting up a newsletter for all of these resources and um, handouts. Um, but we will be doing a topic on March 5th. We are moving the time to 10 a.m. Pacific time. Right now it's been 2 p.m. Um, I want to make sure we can actually capture more people um, and also make it a little bit easier for people like in India um, because the time difference is massive. So it, it's very difficult for any of them to uh, reach a 2 p.m. talk. So um, all that to say, though, I'm open for questions. Um, I'm so sorry about the internet cutting out always you know working fine until it's not right um but we will have a recap available there will be a uh, um, handouts that explain this concept in a little bit of a um easier easier section um and yeah jenny i froze at smaller populations um so luckily I did record everything outside of this. Um, so the recap will have everything, but let's cover, let's do smaller populations. Yeah, and uh, can I do a tutorial on habitat suitability and distribution? Yeah, yeah, actually that is on my, uh, my eventual to-do list. Um, yeah, it's definitely on my eventual to-do list. Um, oh, 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 it was, I didn't have a small population slide. It was part of the area one. Um, but yeah, we can absolutely do that. I've done a lot of uh, Maxent modeling years ago. There's a lot of really cool distribution models um, out there. Maxent is pretty straightforward, and I think it's due for a tutorial. Um, it's something I want to add to a larger list about uh, spatial features in R. So yeah, we will be doing it. I just need to spend the time to actually make that. That one's a little bit more of an involved uh, webinar to make, so, uh, but it will be done. And then let me just recover this uh, about smaller populations, just in case the, the thing uh, froze at the wrong time, right? Um, so this is related to how smaller islands have higher rates of extinction. And they have smaller populations, right? So why do they have smaller populations? Well, 
they're smaller islands, right? Uh, at some level, there, there's many different reasons this can affect them. It could just be because the island itself is smaller, right? Uh, so you can only fit so many organisms on uh, an island. Um, I know when I was doing some work down in Baja, um, there were uh, ospreys on the islands, and they uh, if there's really a nesting pair per island. This is also the same down in Belize. Um, there'd be maybe one nesting pair per island, but if it's big enough, they can have two. So, so that that'd be you know a very clear example, right? Um, but also, there's uh, less habitat heterogeneity, so it can support less species. Um, so, really, just the smaller islands are just overwhelmed by genetic drift, um, which is a topic I want to do a lot more about because it's one of my favorite concepts for some reason. Um, oh, I'm glad I opened up the YouTube chat. I'm realizing the chat is not working on OBS. And uh, yeah, no, no, thank you for coming in. Um, this is by far one of my favorite topics. Um, and it's, it's nice because of how it connects ecology and evolution together really nicely. Um, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I always block off the whole hour. So if there's any questions that you want to ask, please. Please go right ahead. Um, but wow, yeah, no, that that was the perfect timing. So frustrating that the uh, internet went out. Hmm. And yeah. I'm not seeing any new questions, so I'm going to end this stream. Thank you for joining in. Um, if you're watching all the way to the end, of course, check out the recap. All the links and stuff will be down in the description. Um, and we are working on uh, revamping the library and making the webinars and, uh, live in a much, much better way. 